just want to um, thank our uh, sponsors, our national, our national sponsor and Ford panel, who've, uh, who have been so supportive this year, just, just unbelievable in terms of their, their commitment to the Guild. And of course, I'd also like to thank Bill, who um, is sponsoring these uh, TFG live events for the year. They've, um, they're big supporters of this. They participate and um, we really appreciate that. So just thought I'd let you know that. Jack, okay. Quickly, I would just like to say that the upcoming, um, uh, upcoming sessions for a TFG Live are going to be um, Eric Frazier from New Energy Works. He's gonna take us on Talk and Shop. Christian Goodman of um, uh, Hardwick Post and Bean will be also uh, taking us on uh, Talk and Shop. We have, we have uh, presenters who will be presenting as well. So keep a, keep a, uh, an eye out for them and uh, TFG, I mean, in the uh, week of Guild Notes, and um, and please join us. Uh, we have we have a, um, a very large number of people right now. It's sixty seven. Sure, they're going to continue us to join to continue to join us. But but I'd like to um, I'd like to go ahead and get um, right now. It's a.m. and I'll start with an introduction to Jack. Um, Jack Sobin is a craftsman and an architect specializing in timber frame buildings. And since 1980, he has devoted his life to understanding the craft of timber framing, using only traditional hand tools and working right from the forest. He has framed and erected more than 50 structures. Neil Godden has called this uh, forest to frame, which is, I think is a wonderful way to describe the process, forest to frame. Jack's been doing that for, for his whole career. As an architect, he consults on historical structures and designs new timber frames. He was a founding director of the Timber Framers Guild and founder of the traditional research and advisory group, a group that has <coughs> the worst acronym ever, T-TRAG, T-TRAG. Uh, an offshoot of the guild, that is teacher offshoot of the guild, and it is available for members to join. Uh, he has four books to his credit and has taught over six all hand tool workshops. I first met Jack um, some 30 years ago. He was, he was then and still is larger than life. That's just a personal opinion. Um, he, he, uh, he tells some of the best stories that I've ever heard uh, with uh, populated by characters, wonderful characters from, I think he probably learned a lot of things, I suspect uh, good and bad. But what's true then is uh, true now uh, that his generosity in sharing uh, what he knows with anybody willing to listen uh, is legion. Uh, he embodies, in my opinion, he embodies the spirit of the guild. So without further ado, um, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask Jack to uh, begin his presentation and we'll ask you all to stay muted, use the chat function if you'd like to ask questions and Jack will take those questions at the end. Jack. Thank you, Mac. That's pretty kind of you to say all those things about me. Uh, Only some of them might actually true. be true. No, they're all true, Jack. <laughs> I, and, and we should hear the Babcock stories. You have to ask him about Babcock. For okay, well, um, I guess I'll start by sharing my screen here. Um, I'm going to give you a slideshow tonight. And it's a bit of a plot my latest book. Uh, which is called Han Yun. Uh, but since my latest book also is sort of a, a retrospective anyway, so it, it's kind of a good 
good theme for this talk. So the, the craft of timber framing is old. It's, uh, it's at least 7,000 years old, according to some um, archaeological fragments found in, in China. And uh, it's been uh, popular in most of the forested part of the world, at least for some period. And it's left us with some of the quaintest, uh, most beautiful buildings that are, that are still surviving today. Like for instance, this example, this is in, in England at the Wheeldon Downland Museum. I wish this was a real little village you can go and visit, you know, that people actually live in and everything, but it's a museum, but it sort of gives you a great, great feeling for that. Uh, there's beautiful timber frame buildings throughout Europe. Uh, on the left, that's Germany. And on the right, surprisingly, that is um, Oslo in Norway. So there's even some timber framing in the Scandinavian countries. In fact, I've spent quite a bit of time there in the last few years walking around in those buildings. Uh, a lot of it's up in the attics of uh, churches. And of course, America was settled by these same European countries. So we have quite a bit of timber frame architecture in the States. Uh, this is a beautiful little place in North Carolina. If you haven't been here before, you should uh, make a trip down there. We had a little tea drag get together down there uh, one fall. And of course, New England, where I hail from, is uh, in some respects kind of the epicenter of the English uh, settlement of America. Uh, there's uh, quite a few Elizabethan period, first, first period buildings in New England still surviving where the timber framing not only shows on the inside of the house, but it shows on the outside as well. Uh, you can see the decorative brackets and pendants and things on this, on this house. Uh, but the best place to, to see timber framing is, is in hidden places like the attics of churches and meeting houses. Uh, some of the most beautiful stuff in the country is up there. And unfortunately, no one ever gets to see it. And every time I go up into a new church attic, um, I'm, I'm amazed and I always see something new up there. And there's thousands of these, these, uh, these frames up there just waiting for people to look at. And um, there's some spectacular framing inside steeples as well. This one, uh, some of you may have read the article in Timber Framing about this. Uh, this is one of the finest examples that I've run into. And this has been uh, written up nicely. And uh, uh, most people don't get to see this either. So um, for instance, on the, on the right there, and let me get my, uh, my pen here, pointer. Um, here's a, a section to the steeple. And you can see that it's broken into stages and it uses what we call telescoping where each stage uh, extends at least its own height into the one below it, which makes it a very stable uh, structure, very unlikely to be blown off the top of the building, uh, which, you know, could be a, an issue in a hurricane. Um, and the spire, in fact, has a mass that goes down through three stages below it. So it'd be very hard for that spire to, to snap off of that, that steeple. And uh, even when you're inside, you don't get to sort of see this, this kind of arrangement because you're crammed into the space. Uh, there's barely enough room to get from one level to the other uh, when you climb around on these things. But this, this gives you an idea of what happens between the square stage and octagonal stage and how the mass keeps on going right through that. And then over to the right, we got some details of uh, where the two uh, octagons uh, join and then where the mass goes through a series of partners at the top, at the very floor of the, of the, uh, of the spire. Uh, but Barnes is where you're most likely to see old timber framing work. And that's where I got my start back in 1976. Seems like a long time ago now. I've been in a lot of barns since then. Um, so it's, it's a place where you can uh, virtually anywhere in the country, you can find old barns now, even out in the West. Uh, not as many, not as old certainly, but uh, there's a lot of barns and they're going uh, kind of quickly um, there's probably, you know, a third less barns in the world when I got started back in the 70s, maybe more. Anyway, I like to talk about uh, 
pre-industrial craftsmanship. And in one of my talks on hand tools, I talked about uh, maybe coming up with a list of the 10 finest, um, most highly crafted timber frame or wooden buildings in the world. And um, in fact, uh, even if you come up to the top 100 or maybe even the top 1,000 buildings, all of them would have been built before the advent of, of power tools, before the Industrial Revolution, which to me is very surprising. Um, you would expect with, with our hydraulics and computers and high tech this and that, uh, CNC machines, et cetera, we could, we could really do some incredible things. Uh, but it uh, just doesn't seem to happen. Um, you know, so if you look around, for instance, on the left here, this is a tithe barn in England. And there's hundreds of tithe barns in England. And, and then there's, there's other countries that have tithe barns in France and Germany. There's, there's huge isle barns all over Europe. Um, <clears throat> And there's been actually one new one of these built by McCurdy and Company in England, which is very similar. It's a two-tier Kruk barn, uh, probably about the same size too, out of new oak. So somebody is still building this stuff. Um, and on the right is the Stave Church, which you find in Norway. And there's, I think there's 25 or so of these still surviving. Um, if you haven't been to Norway, it should be on your, your bucket list. Uh, I haven't been to this, but this, um, this is another magnificent work of art in, in Russia. Um, of course, it's a log structure. Um, the Orient. Look at this building. Look at the size of the people in front of this building. This is supposedly one of the largest wooden structures in the world. And it was built in the, the 1500s. Uh, and, and no one has duplicated things like this. But to many timber framers, this is the building that we worship. This is supposedly the finest um, timber crafted building surviving to this is a Westminster Hall in London. It's got, I think, a 60 something foot clear span between the, the walls. The roof is actually replacing an earlier aisled roof structure that was there. Uh, so the walls are even older than 1393. Anyway, this is uh, it's an incredible piece. And uh, it looks, when you first look at it, it looks like it might be made up out of molded uh, boards, you know, nailed onto a timber frame or something, but it's not. It's actually done out of uh, solid material. And it's had some repairs done to it. I think it was hit during World War II. Um, but I remember seeing a, um, let me go back here. I remember seeing a section in a museum in London of one of these, uh, the foot of one of these arch uh, trusses here. And it was fully two feet square solid oak that had tenons that these pieces sprung out of here and tenons that continued up over the, the course of this arch. So it, it's made out of solid material. Um, and of course it's got these angels carved on the ends of the hammer beams. Um, so um, back to that, I'm just wondering why we haven't created something like that. Um, why we haven't, we don't have buildings today that we're building that are as, as, that measure up to these old structures. And I just think it's something to do with doing things by hand where you, uh, when you work by hand, you tend to be closer to your material. You tend to understand it better and um, I just, uh, I'm always promoting the use of hand tools as, as Max said, I've done over 60 hand tool workshops. And the, the title of my book is Hand Hewn. And I, I think that just sort of is a catchy thing for, you know, handcrafted rough, rough edges kind of thing. But um, hewing is one of those things that's always fascinated me since the beginning. It's in fact, it's the first tool I got in timber framing was an ads and then a broad axe after that. Um, so I've always marveled at seeing, you know, the millions of hewn timbers that are surviving out there in old structures and thinking to myself back then that um, it couldn't have been that hard to square up a log into a timber with an axe, or they wouldn't have done it so much. Um, and as it turns out, it wasn't that hard. And here's the uh, Neil Godden uh, hewing out timber in my forest uh, that's in the book. 
and it's a um, uh, it's a decent pine log, white pine. And he's um, squaring it up with the traditional tools here. And um, as I say here, it took two and a half hours to do this this timber. And if you were to figure the cost of buying it a dollar a board foot, which is about average around here for a pine timber about this size, uh, the hewer could have been paid could have paid himself fifty dollars an hour uh, to do this and break even. Um, and uh, a curious thing happens with hewing. I've kept a lot of records on hewing. Is that when you get longer and bigger sizes than this, it's even much more. Uh, of an advantage to hew it than it is to have it sawed. Uh, for instance, if this was twice as long as this, you would be uh, you'd be hewing it for you'd be paying yourself twice as much money per hour to do it, uh, and it really goes up at an exponential rate. And that's based on the idea that timber is sold by volume. But when you're hewing, you're hewing surface, so they don't the two don't go up at the same rate. Um, the volume is cubed and the service area is squared. So as you get into bigger, longer stuff, uh, especially the long stuff where you're paying more than a dollar a board foot, you know, you're paying $2 or more per board foot, then it really starts to pay for itself. So who would have thought back then that hewing is still a cost effective way to square something up? And then if you think about uh, the finishing of a timber, uh, I oftentimes will ask my client, what's your preferred finish on timber. Do you want rough sawn? Do you want hand planed? Or do you want hand hewn? And uh, I'd say the majority of people want the hand hewn timber. Of course, we're in New England and, you know, it's sort of people like that old stuff. But if you're going to saw something, I'll pay to have it sawed and then you have to uh, it or hew it afterwards, you're adding more cost onto that. So that has to be taken into, into account. Anyway, uh, the broad axe has a big deal to do with this. Uh, I went through a lot of broad axes before I got the perfect one, which is what Neil is using right here. And uh, people love to, uh, to come in and draw this axe head and trace it, you know, uh, because it is sort of perfectly, perfectly handled and shaped for a uh, craft. And it's got about a seven inch cutting edge on it, um, but there's nothing flat or straight on this, this axe. I used to think at the back of the axe wanted to be dead flat. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, you can see there's about an eighth of an inch here at the ends where the, at the straight edge is sitting on the middle. So on seven inches, uh, that's a bit of a curve on there. It's also, of course, curved when you're looking down at it here. Uh, and what that means is the corners aren't digging in first. It's the middle hitting first, and then the corners sink in. And anytime uh, one part of the axe hits before the other, it's less of a shock to your hands. You know, the middle hits it first and then, then, then it gradually sinks in along its whole length. So it's, it's, it's just easier on, on your body um, to do that. Then of course, the last curve is, this is the back, which normally is pretty flat on an axe, but you can see right towards the edge, it curves off about a sixteenth or so of an inch there. And that allows you to, um, to pull back, if you're, if you're cutting in too deep, you can kind of steer it back out again at the bottom so you can kind of scoop with it. You imagine if that's dead flat, you're only cutting deeper. You can't like pull back on it without leaving a lot of marks. So you get a smoother finish on, this, on the surface of the timber with this type of ax. And you also get some gentle ripples, almost like waves on the, on the sea. So again, the, the axe is, is critical to, to doing this, this kind of hewing. If you've got the wrong axe, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, swearing all day and you're going to be unhappy. You'll have blisters and you won't, you won't pick it up again. And the same thing goes for chisels. Uh, these are three of my favorite uh, chisels here, a corner chisel, a two inch chisel, and my uh, slick, which is a three inch slick. And these have seen a lot of use. Um, uh, all three of these I've had since the uh, the early 80s, and uh, uh, they're doing great still. And um, if you're going to spend a lot of time getting a razor edge on a chisel, you want to have a sheath to put it in. And I actually set it down in the sheath when I'm using it, because there could be grit on the surface of a timber or a, a bench or whatever you put it on. And this is an old chisel. If you look at the edge, you can see the laminated steel here. This is 
first eighth of an inch or so of the starter full steel. And this is a mild steel here. And then that's my micro bevel that I have on there, which uh, I get with a 10,000 grit waterstone. And you can see the, the steel on the edge of the chisel as well going up here. Now it actually curls up at the edge a little bit. So uh, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about some of the ancient proportions. Um, I'm also an architect. Uh, you know, I've been doing architecture and timber framing side by side for my whole career. Um, and I take great interest in old structures and how they're designed and laid out. And you can see that this Smith's New Hampshire carriage shed for a well-to-do um, mansion, I think it's around 1800. Uh, the designer of this was certainly using geometry and of course the compass. Um, you, uh, you can see uh, that the shape of the building in this, this manner here is a equilateral triangle. This is a, a perfect square here. Obviously that's a semicircle. Um, and, uh, and these ellipses are probably uh, based on a 30, 60 uh, angle. Um, uh, gambrels. Um, there's been a lot of ugly gambrels built out there in the last three or four decades, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and they could all do a little proportion. You know, many of them are like fast food restaurants and things, um, outlet stores, etc. But if you look at old gamble roof buildings like this Shaker Meeting House in Canberra, New Hampshire, uh, I've overlaid the geometry of the roof on this. It's two uh, triangles that are identical. Uh, one's on edge and one's laying flat. And it basically bisects the, the length of the roof. So the joint is exactly halfway. And the angle of this roof, let's say it's a 7 and 12. This is a 12 and 7 down here. So it's the invert of that. And that just looks good. You know, if you look at that building, you say, oh, that's a handsome, handsome camera building. Now this little symbol right here, uh, in England called this a daisy wheel. Um, I talked with a uh, Romanian ethnogeographer 30, 40 years ago and asked him what that represented. And he said, that's one of the oldest symbols in, in culture uh, in, in the world. It uh, represents the, the sun, which, yeah, duh, yeah, I can see that. It's like the rays of the sun. Uh, and. Um, it always bugged me that the English call it a daisy wheel. Well, uh, Laurie Smith from Wales uh, set me straight on that when he came over to do a workshop with me on geometry and timber framing. And he said, well, you'd be curious to know that the, uh, the daisy is a flower that follows the sun throughout the day. In fact, the name daisy comes from day's eye, which is the sun. So I said, bingo, we're both right. <laughs> it's a sun symbol and a daisy wheel. I love it when that's sort of a happy ending kind of a thing. I love that uh, story. Anyway, here we have a plan of Harmonsworth Tithe Barn, which is near Heathrow Airport. It's, uh, it's about 40 by 200 feet. Uh, beautiful barn that's been restored. Um, dating from 1427, maybe. Um, anyway, you can see that uh, it's laid out using the daisy wheel, uh, multiple daisy wheels. And it actually gives the, uh, the width of the building, the base spacing, uh, the location of the aisle posts here. Um, it's just a, an incredible thing. But if you go into that barn and look around, you'll see that on these plinth stones that are at the bottom holding up these aisle posts, these big plinth stones are like three feet square or so, have scribed into them a daisy wheel on the south side. And the tie beams, which go from, from post to post up above here, have a daisy wheel scribed on the south face of those as well. So um, you can tell the masons and the carpenters are both on board with this um, with this daisy wheel. Obviously, if it's carved into the stones, <laughs> it's a sure bet that, that that's what was used in this building. Um, the Pythagorean theorem and three four five triangle. Uh, all of us that are builders uses three four five all the time, of course. Uh, but this was once a secretive. Thing. It was not taught in schools until fairly recently, and I'm not even sure if it is now. I know it was when I went through, but uh, 
it's possible they don't even touch on the importance of the three, four, five. But this, this enabled you to be a builder. If you didn't have the knowledge of the three, four, five, you could not build, you could not square, you were out of business. So it's essential in sort of the geometry of buildings. And uh, for instance, it shows up in this roof pitch here, which is a nine and 12 by uh, modern roof pitch angles here. Um, and I should mention that in the old days, pitch was not measured as rise over run. It was measured as uh, length over span. So this is before about 1800. Um, they used the length of the rafter over the width of the building, which seems like a ridiculous way. It doesn't give you any angles or anything. Um, I know from this, you could figure out the actual trigonometry if you wanted to, but it was very practical because it told you how long a raft you needed for a given span of buildings. So with a five-eighths pitch, you knew you needed a rafter that was five-eighths the width of the building. And the most common pitch in Europe is a three-quarter pitch where the rafter is three-quarters the width. It's quite a bit steeper pitch than this. And it's primarily for thatched roofs. Uh, another common proportional element is the golden proportion or the golden section as it's called which is indicated by a uh, the Greek letter phi or phi I think you can pronounce it both ways and the golden proportion is a natural proportion found in nature um, and you construct that you start out with a square here you bisect the square you put your compass on the bisected length there and swing an arc down, and then this length to that length is the golden proportion, which is one to 1 1.618. Um, that's a pretty good approximation because the next decimal was zero after that. And, um, and by the way, the Fibonacci sequence, which some of you may remember from math way back then, um, is, um, is the sum of, each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. So three is the sum of two and one, five is three and two, et cetera. And these numbers approximate the, the golden proportion. As they get bigger, they get closer and closer to the golden proportion. And uh, I mentioned that this is in nature. For instance, it's in the joints of your hand. If you look at the, your, your finger joints, uh, starting at the nail, they get progressively larger. That proportion is the golden proportion. Uh, so those three joints in your fingers is one. Conch shells is another one. Here is how you would create a um, golden proportion spiral. Each quarter of a circle is a is increased by the um, by the golden proportion, and you get this beautiful little spiral. And here, cartridges we're using this for for decades. These are both from around 1800. Um, this, I believe, is the golden spiral. This is, is a different one, but the carpenters had different numerical spirals they would use. Uh, these show up in old pattern books. Uh, the three, four, five. Um, this is a 30 by 40 barn, and it's in cross section. It's laid out using an equilateral triangle, which is as old as time itself. Uh, this shows up in the phases of pyramids. It's in Greek temples. It's in the Gothic arch uh, from in the 1200s. Um, so I find this in about 90% of English barns that I've surveyed, measured up, and I, can, I can't wait to finish this cross-sectional drawing because I will stick my compass on and see if that's the case. And I'd say 90, roughly 90% 90 of them are based on that, that principle. And if you look at the roof of this barn, this is very unusual. It's, it's got three bays, and in one bay, they're roughly three feet on center. And the rafters are four feet on center, and then they're roughly five. That adds up to 41 if they're exactly three, four, five. But uh, it, needless to say, it's very close to that. Um, there's no earthly reason for doing that other than playing with, with numbers and, and uh, flaunting your, your, uh, your knowledge of the three, four, five. Uh, you, know, you wouldn't even notice this if you went in the barn unless somebody pointed it out to you. In fact, I, di I didn't notice until I got home to draw it up. And I, I said, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And uh, I went back and checked it. So here's a little pool house that I designed uh, with a um, it's square. It's got an OG uh, hipped roof, which was really fun to frame for the for the crew. And um, all four sizes of the building look identical. And it's laid out 
internally in plan using a uh, square within a square, which is another ancient technique. Uh, so I'm kind of flaunting it here and you can see it in the roof frame uh, up above as well. And uh, in the partitions here and each, uh, each door has a, a different view out towards uh, one goes to a pool, one goes to the, the field, and one goes back to the house. Uh, so, so anyway, oh, I forgot to mention what rusticated siding is. Um, this is wood siding that is scored to look like stone blocks. And it's an old technique. Uh, there's quite a few still surviving in the country. And uh, it, it's indicated that originally when they built these, they, they painted them with a shellac. And before it dried, they threw a fine sand at the building that would stick to the shellac and make it appears to be sandstone. So it's a way of, of uh, making your building look, uh, you know, more upscale, more expensive. Uh, and they even carved in the uh, lintels over the windows. On this. Oh, this, this house on the left is a typical kind of New England Cape you'd find in, in anywhere, you know, even parts of New York state uh, and probably a little bit farther south as well. Um, but a curious thing, a lot of these houses, if you look at them straight on, like you see on the right, the door is off center, as is the chimney. It's not a mistake. It's a, um, and this one is really exaggerated. They're not usually off quite that much. Um, but it's designed to make the building look grander. And it's always, uh, the door is always farther away from the direction you normally approach the house from, coming up from town or coming up the street or uh, it's it's always offset away from the, the prominent approach direction. <laughs> and it basically makes the house look longer than it really is. So it's just a little trick with perspective. So uh, next time you see one of these capes, uh, stand on it straight on, see if, it, if it's off center. Uh, <laughs> another form they used, um, and, and I came up with this description of it, uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward to me that uh, the mountain form, which is also kind of a sand dune or a wave, resting wave in the ocean. Um, but it's something that's been used since uh, the beginning of time. The pyramids are basically imitating mountains. Um, this is St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow. You can see it's sort of a long curved sweep going up to the high point here. Um, Mount St. Michel off the coast of France. They took a, a, a lump out of the the water here and they add it on to continue that sort of curving profile up. Uh, one of my favorites was the New York skyline of the 1940s. Uh, I'm not that old, but it shows up in a lot of old movies. It's the first thing people see when they come to the new world. You know, they get off of Ellis Island, they can see that skyline in lower Manhattan, which if you see it more from the south, it's actually even more pronounced of a, of a mountain sort of curve. And the buildings themselves within this are also kind of shaped like mountain peaks. In fact, this building right here shows up at right. You can see that the stonework on tops of the setbacks is a whiter stone simulating snow-capped peaks on top of the, the mountain. Isn't that an incredible thing? And I mentioned stave churches before, but this is that same curve. And Norway, is, of course, is all mountains. So it's an obvious form for them to pick, um, to imitate. And of course, the classic Disney castle, uh, you know, exact uh, mountain form. That's no accident that Walt Disney has used this thing as his logo since, uh, well, since I was a kid anyway. Um, it's just a very appealing thing to everyone. It just brings out something within us. Uh, and it's, it's the focal point of uh, Disneyland, Disney World. And it can even occur on a small scale. That's why buildings look better when they have a cupola on them or a, a chimney coming out the center of a, of a roof. It just it helps create that sort of nice curved shape going up um, to the peak. Here's a little carriage barn I did, and you can see that same sort of uh, mountain type profile here. And this is a two car garage that I, you know, I hate sort of the look of the typical garage. So I created something that looks like an old carriage barn here um, with a broken back lean-to roof on the back and one off the end. Again, it's a very pleasing form to die. It looks at rest. It looks, you know, a mountain looks at rest when you see it in the distance. 
So there's a billing that sort of follows that uh, profile. So let's talk a little bit about vernacular architecture, which is my favorite. Um, when I was in college, we had two, two groups in the architecture um, department. We had the, uh, and this is unofficial, by the way, we had the vernaculars, which I belong to, and the postmodernists who were creating these white boxes and weird kind of, well, I won't go into that. But anyway, um, vernacular architecture has always been my focus. Um, and it's that architecture that we travel around the world to see. The, the most quaint places in the world, like this uh, waterway in the Netherlands here, or this uh, Greek isle here, are the places where people travel to. They don't travel to see, uh, you know, roadside big box stores on, on super highways. They go to these quaint little little villages and, and places that uh, uh, that exhibit vernacular architecture at its at its finest. Uh, here's Japan, and you get all different, you know, just in the same, within the same country, you get a hundred different vernaculars, depending on where you travel. And this one has tile roofs, you'll find areas with thatched roofs, with wood roofs, um, it just depends on, on the area. And vernacular is, uh, is um, built by local hands, using local materials, following local traditions and taking into account the local climate, its variants. So it's, it's suited to that area specifically. And people often talk of speaking in the vernacular. It means the local language. Uh, this is an unusual vernacular here. This is in Norway. This is a copper smelting town uh, from the 1700s. And it still has heaps of slag piles behind the houses here, but uh, uh, log structures with uh, with living roofs, uh, sod roofs on them. You can just see how different this is from, from in, you know, the, the Netherlands waterway houses or the Greek hillside island community. Uh, this is from Transylvania, Romania. Uh, this is on kind of on my bucket list someday to go to. Uh, but here are thatched roofs, log walls, uh, uh, daubing, uh, stone, quite a bit of timber. A different part of Romania, you get a different Look here, here we have wood roofs, um, lots of wood. In fact, uh, fences are woven wattles with a wood roof over them to protect them as well. Uh, and thatch in this section here, wooden gateways. So you can see it's, it just varies depending on the client, climate and the, the forest and, um, and the culture. And here's a couple of far flung examples here. This is in Indonesia, these are tribal chieftains houses. Um, these are, uh, this is a, a seaside in, in Norway along the fjords where it was primarily a, a boat culture for, for most of its history. It wasn't until they discovered oil in the 1970s and they started building more roads and tunnels to get to these, these uh, remote places. Uh, before then, everybody had a boat house and uh, the houses were all clustered near the, the sea. And of course, Venice. Um, if you haven't been to Venice, you gotta go there. This is just the most incredible place. Um, I can't say enough about Venice, um, especially in the afternoon when the, when the light, the sun comes through and hit, hits those, uh, those beautiful masonry buildings, all with subtly different uh, pinks and browns and blues. Uh, it's just an incredible spot. Um, I recommend that to everyone. So, um, what is the evidence of timber framing today? Um, you know, I have to ask myself, I'm, I mean, I've devoted my life to it, but uh, it's nice to think about why it's so important today. And uh, it's probably as important today as it's, it's ever been. Um, one is the thoughtfulness of building. It's not a thing where you think about it like that and it goes up overnight, you order from a catalog and there it is. This is something you plan, you, uh, you know, you take a little time on it. And it takes time to harvest the timbers and, and you know, for the people to cut the joints and then raise it up and and you have a raising party or if you, even if you put it up with a crane you nail a tree on it and you celebrate that with your neighbors and and uh, and open some drinks um, and it's a life-changing thing i once had uh, some clients that told me the um, their house raising party was the second most important day in their life and of course I was flattered by that, but I asked him, I said, well, what's the most important day? He goes, well, it was the birth of our first child. 
and uh, they had, uh, I think they had three kids and uh, he didn't mention the marriage and his wife was right there with him. So they, they both agreed that that house raising was the biggest, uh, biggest, most important day in their life. I guess they had 200 people come to their raising. Uh, honesty of construction. I mean, that's, um, you see the bones of the building, you see what's, what's uh, keeping it from racking in the wind. You see what's holding up the roof when the, there's a load of snow on it. Um, my daughters used to say they felt better sleeping in a room where you could see the timbers in the ceiling than in one where it's just a white box, sort of. Um, they, they just felt more comfortable. Of course, they grew up in timber frames. Um, and there's a connection to the past. Um, we're continuing to craft, you know, even if your ancestors didn't come over to Mayflower, uh, you feel like you're part of something that has a longer tradition. Um, and people, I think people need that. They need to know that it's not just them, that people came before them and people will come afterwards and the house will last long after they're gone. Their children will remember it and then their children. Uh, so it's, it's that connection. Um, and then there's the whole green building thing. Now, when I got started in this craft, there was a green building boom. There was a back to the land movement, they called it. Uh, a lot of hippies and, uh, you know, people building teepees and queuing out log buildings. They go out into the woods with an ax and come back, you know, uh, tell everybody they built a little house out there. Uh, but it's, it's come around again, full circle. It's just, it's a green method of building. It's uh, wood is about the most green material you can pick, especially if it's local um, or if it's recycled material, uh, which this one is on the right. Um, it has a low embodied energy. Uh, it lasts, it's, it's, it can be recycled over and over. I mean, this building's already had one life before this, and uh, many barns I've worked on have had two or three lives before uh, they were taken down to make a new building out of. Uh, so it's, uh, you can't say enough about green construction method. Um, and of course, uh, people love old timbers. You know, these, this is a building made from recycled timbers from, um, you know, being dismantled from old barns. It's not from one particular building, it's just from a, um, a, a dealer in recycled timber. And when they get cleaned up and try to, uh, you know, get rid of a lot of the empty mortises and things, uh, it looks pretty sharp. And uh, it gives the building uh, quite a bit of character. And who wouldn't want to sleep in a room such as this with these, these rugged posts in the corners? Uh, and by the way, corners is where you know there's inherent strength in a building. If you take a box and you cut the corners out of the box it kind of falls apart. So people inherently know that the strength in a, in a room or in a building comes from the corners. And of course they see the diagonal bracing as well on this. And timber framing doesn't have to be old timbers and it doesn't have to be a particular style. It can be anything. This, this happens to be an arts and crafts style house, but you can make, uh, you know, high tech, funky, you can do whatever you want with timber framing. You can mix and match. Uh, the sky is kind of the limit in design. I mean, once you know the language of timber framing carpentry, so to speak, you can create your own, you know, specific products. Uh, you know, there's a certain language following mortise and tenons and, and pegs and dovetails and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, how you sort of bring loads down and all that. But within that, you can create a, a plethora of different uh, designs. This is something that I've kind of strived throughout my career is this organic medieval revival thing. It's kind of based on, on ancient ways of building. So I'm using the language of medieval framing, but I'm using organic shapes within that. Um, and, and a lot of times off the owner's own property. Uh, and it's, uh, it's fairly low grade material, you know, especially these kind of pieces. These are normally not even taken out of the forest uh, unless it's for firewood. Um, so we're using more of the tree and uh, we're also, if you, if you want to help a forest, you don't just take the best, the straightest, the biggest trees out all the time because you will you'll do what's called high grading where you're taking, by taking out all the great stuff, you're leaving the, uh, the lousy stuff basically. Well, they may look lousy or some, but anyway, but if you're, so if you're taking some straight stuff, but you're also taking some curved crotches and things, you're, you're helping your forest out as well. Here's a house that's made of just 
Oh, her store. Look at that tree on the right holding up that wall of the double one. Those are yeah. Jack, we can't hear you. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah, you're back. We still need to mute everybody. Okay, am I still good? Good. Yes. Yes, Jack, we can right. hear you. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, anyway. Um, if everybody could please mute. Jack, please yeah. go ahead. I can't get my, uh, my computer to move here. <laughs> My computer is frozen. Huh. My screen said that the host unmuted us. There you go. Okay. Well, you yeah, I muted us when I couldn't hear Jack. I wanted to make sure everybody was unmuted. <laughs> so I wanted to hear Jack. Okay. So. All right. So anyway, here's uh, here's a little cozy sitting spot with a couple of cherry crotch posts supporting it, and uh, and pole rafters. These are sawn on just the top side and the bark is peeled off the round edges on that. And here's a house, it's a weekend, uh, kind of a guest house. And I normally don't like this much wood in a timber frame building. Uh, I don't mind the wood on the ceiling, but it's, it's usually too much wood on the walls if you're living there. But if it's a weekend place, uh, people kind of love that, that wood and it, you know, it's, it's sort of a dark, restful kind of a space in the building. Uh, this is a um, an education center for an arboretum in the Catskill Mountains of New York State, and uh, actually did a book on this called Twenty One Trees because in the building we used twenty one different species of trees, basically one of each species they had within the arboretum. Uh, they have a hundred and something acres there, and uh, and uh, the timber frame for this was cut by um, Brad Morris of Uncarved Block. I don't know if any of Brad's crews on here, but that uh, they can be really proud of this building. We used the stone that came out of the foundation. We had to blast out a foundation or, or you know, jackhammer out a foundation. And this all the stone was laid up from that foundation hole. Um, and so it's a native uh, kind of a blue stone that's, that's common up there. And uh, the siding, the timber frame, the flooring, all that in the building came off the property. And then here's a little carriage barn, which you come, you see when you come out of the building. And that was the first building we built. That's all organic timber, crotches and curves. Uh, you know, little, the post is scribed to a stone here that's uh, set in the floor. Uh, even this table was made out of timber that came out of the forest and as well as the flooring, uh, the lights they did buy those. Um, in this room here, this is the, uh, the large, um, meeting space, which has these big uh, sort of whole trees kind of leaning off, supporting the purlins. You kind of feel like you're in the forest somewhat. And these are, um, these are a mixture of species. I think this one right here is, is black cherry, but there's, there's all the typical species of sort of a northern hardwood forest here. We got yellow birch and sugar maple and black birch and uh, red oak and uh, spruce and balsam and ironwood and um, basswood, uh, poplars, you name it. Um, and uh, I did a little uh, sketch in this room of each uh, look in two directions and I labeled on the sketch all the, or I numbered all the pieces in the frame. So when students come in here in groups, they can grab one of these uh, keys and they can look at a 
look in the direction of the drawing shows and he can identify what each uh, timber component is. I've labeled every single one on there. So if they want to find a, a northern red oak or a American beach piece, they can they can find the key and locate it in the room. So it's kind of a an educational thing for the kids. And uh, they also have pictures of each of the species with the bark and the leaves and the buds so that they can uh, help identify them. And if you look at the flooring here, it's book matched. This is actually pretty low grade material here. In fact, I had to fill some holes in the maple. Uh, I think this was mostly red maple. Um, so it's designed to be, uh, you know, from one end to the other is one sort of log, or maybe there's two logs in there. Um, but it, it's laid down in the order that they were sawed out of the of the log. So there, we call that slip matching or book matching if it's only two. Um, in fact, the table was book matched on the top. You can't really see it in this picture, but uh, that's something that doesn't cost any money, really. It just you have to be there when you're sawing it out and, you know, mark the, the pieces, but it doesn't cost any more. But it really, it really adds a lot to, uh, to something when you book match or, or slip match things. And uh, as Max said, I've been teaching hand tool courses um, uh, since uh, 84, I think is the first one I did. Um, I've done over 60 of them. And I'm trying to spread this, this craft. I mean, the craft was nearly on its way out when many of us, you know, back in the 70s got, tried to bring it back around again. Um, and it shouldn't have been going out. It, the sort of the, the rush of the 60s and everything kind of uh, was throwing out a lot of things that shouldn't have been thrown out uh, and timber framing is one of those. Um, so I've just been trying to bring back the traditional sort of aspect of timber framing and that's why I've, I've devoted my life to using hand tools. And, um, and this happens to be in Sweden here. I've done three workshops over in Sweden. In fact, I was supposed to do one this year as well and I got one planned for the next two years. Uh, as well. Uh, they're thirsty for this. There was a tradition in Sweden, but there was no no sort of continuation of that. Um, and there's people repairing these old buildings and studying, studying them now, and they're, they're, they're picking up these crafts once again. I mean, there's certainly plenty of log structures over there and plenty of log builders practicing the craft, but very little timber framing uh, until now. But they've actually formed a Nordic uh, guild now of, of timber framers. The, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, Iceland, and Finland, maybe. Um, on the right is a, a crock workshop that we did at uh, Rocky Mountain um, Institute. Uh, this is with Peter Haney and Neil Godden. And um, it's at 9,000 feet above sea level. Uh, so once we got used to the, the, um, the thin air up there, we did pretty good. Uh, we built this beautiful two bay crock frame and I'm just putting in a plug for this because we're, do, we're doing a crock workshop um, hardwood coming up uh, the end of the month uh, and crocks are always popular in fact um, uh, the U.S. has sort of led the crock revival I had done a couple of crocks uh, back in the 80s and I went to England and I saw a newspaper headline while I was over there that said the first crock frame in 300 years went up in England and I thought it was probably carpenter oak and woodland. But uh, anyway, I was thinking, well, wow, there's something, I'm, you know, Americans have uh, came up with here first, although of course the craft, the, the crook building craft started in England probably uh, back in the 1200s. But uh, anyway, we're, so we're hopefully responsible for helping to bring it back, you know, inspiring them uh, to do that. So. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my reflections on my past uh, 44 years of uh, timber framing. So uh, I think now's the time I'd be happy to answer questions. I'm monitoring the, the chat, Jack, and, and I haven't really seen a lot of questions there. So uh, folks, um, you are able to unmute yourselves. If you have a question for Jack, please, um, please speak up. Unmute yourself and then speak up if you would. I, I don't have a question, uh, but Jack, all of a sudden I understand how long it's going to take me to finish cruising the next piece of timber that I work on because I'm going to be looking for unique uses for all of those tall trees. <laughs> That's great. 
I think it was fascinating. I appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you. I'm happy to do it for the guild. Well, Jack, what are you going to do for the next 44 years? Gosh, I hope I have that many more years. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm going to unlock more secrets of how things used to be done in the past. Uh, I, I'm still learning. Every, every old building I go into, I'll, I'll, I'll often find something new in there that I haven't seen before. Some little, little trick that no one would even think to even spot anymore. But uh, when you've worked with hand tools for your whole life, you, you tend to look at how things were done on, on the old work. So, uh, so I'm still learning and I'm still discovering things. You know, my body, body's kind of shot these days, but uh, I'm still at it. I can still hew. And you're still using mostly hand tools is what I'm understanding. That's it, I'm still doing hand tools. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I've just been doing it my whole life and, and they, my tools know what to do. They've, uh, I've been using them for so many years that, uh, you know, people say the tool knows what to do, but it's actually your muscle memory or your body, your brain, muscle coordination, memory, whatever it is. Uh, the tool almost will do the job without me even watching it because I've been doing it for so long with the same tools. Um, and I hope everyone gets the experience that, that uh, unique uh, thing in time. And Jack, we did have a question from uh, Jennifer. Can you talk about the pool roof? The pool roof. Sure. What would you like to know about that? And well, Jennifer? So were, those, no, were those all cut from curved pieces? It looked like multiple curves in that. I don't know if you can go back to that slide. Yeah, I could go back to it. Um, I think I could. Um, it just looked like a really fascinating, uh, yeah. complicated roof. <laughs> Had me intrigued. Yeah, that um, that uh, was cut from from straight timber, uh, yeah. and it's it's all uh, mostly straight timber. There was some curved pieces in there, but uh, uh, it was cut from large section pieces. Uh, and it's not a real strong curve to it, you know, it's, it's very subtle. So the cross grain on most of that stuff falls within cross grain sort of requirements for like a number two species, which is what it's designed for. Uh, I didn't actually build this. This was done by uh, David E. Lanoue Inc. Uh, in Stockbridge, Mass. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, I guess we could have tried to find more curved stuff on some of those, but uh, like I said, it, it, it's a very subtle curve on that. Jack, we also got the question, where did you uh, find your best broad ax? Gosh, um, I'm not even sure now, it's been so long. Um, you know, my first one I bought when I was still in college, uh, when I was working for Babcock for the summer, I picked one up and um, I probably went through six or eight broad axes that uh, each one was su successively better than the previous one. Uh, and they went from being like a 12 and a half inch cutting edge down to uh, the seven and a quarter, which is what my present one is. Uh, so you don't need these giant axes. They're, those are kind of unwieldy. They weren't, they weren't the axes that were used to do um, most of the hewn work we see today. They were, they were designed to square up large sections of timber, sometimes two feet square to go into the holds of ships up in the Great Lakes or on the West Coast, you know, when they're just uh, shipping timber and they want to square it up to fit into the ship. They don't care what it looks like. So if you want to do hewing work, uh, you generally want a smaller uh, cutting edge. And I, for new axes, I prefer these uh, Swedish uh, Gransfors Brooks axes. Um, I have a double beveled one of those and it's a much smaller, lighter ax and you can easily swing it all day without being fatigued. Um, so I wish I, I, I could tell you, I, I probably got that ax from a, a flea market or a antique tool dealer, but I put the handle on it. It didn't come with that handle. Um, so, Jack, you know, it takes a little time to tune up one of those things too. Yeah. Could you say what, 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 
I didn't catch the name of the axe, the Swedish axe, and I'm afraid, uh, you know, I'm concerned other people didn't either. Uh, you said it was a Swedish Grandster, I think you said? Grandsfurs Brooks, or Grandsfurs Brook. Um, and I think Brook means Brook. Um, it's B R U K. Um, Grands, G R A N S F O R, Grands for Brook. Yes. Um, and it's old in the state now. There's several tool dealers that sell them. Uh, I can't think of anybody offhand, but uh, they're, they're definitely available if you say Swedish uh, axes. And that's not the only company. There's other companies making new broad axes, um, some on a much smaller scale, but that's the one that I've had. I, went, I took a tour of the factory when I was over there. And of course I had to buy an ax on the way out. You know how that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we did have a question about where your book is available in Canada from uh, uh, Dan and Kimberly Reagan. Any idea? Well, I would just go on to, um, to um, Amazon and, or to Guild. The Guild sells them, right? It, it does, but I bet the shipping is a hell of a lot cheaper on Amazon. So I don't think that that's bad advice to folks in Canada because our shipping costs, I've noticed, are very high. So if you want to support the Guild, yeah. go for it. Otherwise, Amazon. We also yeah, you know what? When I look at the price on Amazon, it's about $10 cheaper than I can buy it for. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to say, um, I don't know how they no. do that. I don't know how they do it either. Um, modern living. Uh, somebody was curious about how uh, you go about sourcing trees. That's from Sal Wilson down in Arkansas. Anything you look for in particular? Okay, well, um, in my early years, I didn't have any my own property, so I would always take timbers off the owner's property. And uh, I haven't met an owner yet that wouldn't want to have some of, of their timber used in their own building. So they feel honored to do that. So if you get a job and you need something special, ask the owner if they, have, if they haven't owned some timber or if they have friends that have a, a woodlot. Um, and I bought my woodlot, I don't know, about 23, four years ago. Um, and that changed that changed my whole sort of career. I mean, I, I can't tell you how important that was to me. I bought a 60 acre woodlot and I took two or three frames out of that woodlot every year and I was still growing more timber than I was cutting. And it's, it, the trees are bigger now, of course, than they were then and there's more trees and you know, it's, it's just a much improved forest over the years. Um, so so I, uh, when you work timber from the forest, you, you tend to be able to recognize uh, what you need uh, when it's standing, when it still has bark on it. You can sort of see which trees are going to have, you know, clear grain, which ones are going to have spiral grain, which ones could have some red rot in them, um, you know, which, which forks are better forks than other forks, um, what species are, are easier to work, you know, et cetera. You sort of, uh, once you get your own woods, you, you get to learn that. Um, whereas if you're just buying timber from a sawmill or buying logs from a logger, uh, you don't know the circumstances that the tree grew in. You didn't know if it was a leaning tree or if it was on a windswept mountain ridge or if it was down in a hollow or in the floodplain. Um, so, you know, making things right from the forest really brings you much more understanding of the material. Uh, I, I recommend that to everyone, you know, even if they just do one tree. <laughs> One tree in their neighbor's woods or something, you know, uh, I'd recommend that to everyone. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, Jackson, Jackson asks, your wall or roof of choice? What's my wall or roof of choice? That's the question. Um, well, I never like to do the same thing exactly twice. So, um, you know, I've done a lot of crook buildings, but I've done buildings with purlin plates, with continuous ridge beams, with uh, roof trusses and several different kinds of trusses, um, you know, curved stuff. Uh, you know, the structurally, my favorite roof is probably something with purlin plates in it, like, or an aisle building, like the Dutch barns. Um, where the, the rafters are supported near their mid-span. It just it, it takes away a lot of the thrust on the, uh, the wall plate. Um, 
But, you know, again, I like to do different things like this OG roof pool house thing here. You know, I just, I just wanted to do one of those. Um, so, so there it is. You know, it, it gets boring doing the same thing over and over, I would think. Um, so I try to, to vary materials, vary roof systems. And of course the roof is the, the frame. You know, that's, that's the first decision you make when you're designing a building is what the roof is. You know, you need to have some sort of a, a concept in your head, whether it's, uh, you know, an aisled structure or uh, an OG hipped roof or whatever. You need to know that going into the project, I think. Um, and the whole thing kind of works around that, you know. Jack, how, did, how does um, architecture inform your career? Well, um, you know, when I was going to school for architecture um, and I took that summer job working on the old barns, I felt like I had something over the other architecture students. I had a little building experience. Uh, some of the people in the school had never picked up a hammer, never climbed a ladder, you know, never done any real physical work on a building. So I always thought that I wanted to be more of a master builder rather than an architect or a contractor. You know, the architect draws the drawings, but doesn't get to build anything. So uh, they don't get the full respect of the builder. And the builder um, just builds things and doesn't design them. So they don't really get the respect of the architect. So you got this sort of dichotomy uh, where you've separated the design from the construction and it puts one against the other sometimes, you know, the, um, you know, one, the architect says the builder did that, screwed that up. And the builder says the architect screwed up the drawings, you know, and so I think the old concept, which um, is, you know, the historical one is the master builder, the person who could not only design, but could go to the, the quarry and pick out the, the stone that they wanted used or go into the forest and point out the trees they wanted to use uh, or could pick up a tool of a, of a craftsperson and say, this is how you're supposed to be using that tool. You know, you're doing it wrong. So they, they sort of work their way up from being an apprentice up to being a master uh, master builder. So that's that's what I think the best direction in architecture should be. Um, and I probably get a lot of flack from architects about that. Um, but um, it means better buildings, you know, when, when, when the architects is, is more in tune with the construction and the, and the the contract is more in tune with design. You tend to get better buildings. Uh, and it's pretty obvious out there uh, what's happening. Yeah, I'd uh, say that's hard to argue with. I have a little more practical question here. Is that have you ever had a French snap go bad? Uh, no, but I wouldn't do it on a piece where it could go bad. Why, have you had one go bad? <laughs> this was Kelly. Kelly, Seth Kelly, you wanna speak up there, buddy? Unmuting, Kelly. Okay. I think he's probably embarrassed that he had one to go bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he spoke up in chat. He said, always oh, been good. So it, um, we have from, uh, from Doug Pollack. I want, I'm wondering if Jack could comment on the economics of timber framing using hand tools versus power tools. Gee, I wonder if you could, Jack. Certainly. <laughs> well, I, uh, I rarely had to bid against companies using uh, power tools, but one I can remember was uh, the, uh, the visitor center at Hancock Shaker Village. Um, it's a very big open sort of frame uh, that you first walk into before you go into the, the museum itself. And um, the package, the bid package included, you have to design it, engineer it, and construct it. And uh, I had a crew of three, I think, at the time. And um, I bid against Ted Benson, Benson Woodworking. And uh, I remember my price was uh, about two thirds of what he, his price was. And uh, my frame included a lot more timber. It included 45 foot uh, plates and purlin plates and uh, a ridge beam as well and um, and trusses and, and all sorts of uh, things that weren't in his design um, and um, 
and yet I, my crew got some pretty decent money at the time. As I remember, they were making probably more per hour than typical. I, mean, I don't know what Ted was paying his guys, but uh, you know, more per hour than typical companies were paying their their guys who were knocking out more than tenon joints. So, so I've always maintained that it's uh, it's economical, uh, especially if you're starting out. You don't have to invest in a lot of expensive, you know, Mafel chain mortisers and and uh, you know, and sh and huge shops and everything. We worked outdoors uh, in good weather, and we we work on braces or make pegs on rainy days, um, that sort of thing. So there's, it's a low overhead if you work by hand. And, uh, you know, most of our buildings, that building went up with a crane, but most of our buildings go up with, uh, with a gin pole, block and tackle. And I don't know what cranes cost these days per hour, but, uh, you know, for the cost of a crane out there, you could probably pay six or eight people uh, to do the work. And it's much faster than a crane, uh, especially when we used to raise buildings by hand. I would put up a good sized house in about two hours and there might be 150 people there helping. And if I said, hey, I need that pile of floor joists. And I turn my back and they'd be hitting me in the rear, trying to get up on the second floor. They'd be coming up so fast. And we could literally, you know, lay them down as fast as they were handed up. And the same went with rafters. You know, I said, okay, stand all the rafters up against the, the plate, you know, on the, from the ground up to the plate. And they'd, they'd all be leaning up there in about five minutes. And then we three or four people just be sliding them up onto the roof and, and popping them in. So a hand raising is certainly faster if you can get past sort of the engineering uh, the um, insurance aspect of that, uh, which can be a little scary sometimes. But uh, yeah, I think uh, hand tools are, are still economical. All right, we have a question from Jay. Do you think sun daisies were placed to indicate position? Placed afterwards for decoration. Well, um, when I find them in the barn, uh, it's usually just in one spot, and it's always on the south face of a timber. Now, uh, when they numbered buildings, they numbered it in a particular way. You know, in scribe rule era, they numbered buildings. Uh, it might have been from north to south, uh, from west to east, or it might have been from left to right on one wall and from left to right on the opposite wall. So. The number one goes with the number four and the two with the, with the uh, three and, and et cetera. Um, but I, I think that when you find just a single one in the building, it could be sort of the like the north arrow on a drawing, the key to how the, the, the kit goes together, basically. When I talked with uh, uh, Frederick Briant, the French Compagnon about years ago, he said uh, uh, there was a lot of care taken to the way the building was oriented, the way you approach it on the lot when you go to put the building up, and even the way it was loaded on the truck to go to the site. Um, so it was always in the mind of the carpenter. Things didn't just sort of, you know, end up uh, however they, they would, you know, that was all carefully thought out ahead of time. So so I'm thinking that it's, it's like the North Arrow on a drawing. It, you know, if you were given this kit with all the numbered parts, you find a, a daisy wheel or the simple, and now you know how it goes up. So there you have it. Okay. Uh, from Glenn Mc, McCrimmon. Grant, Glenn McCrimmon. Jack, do you prefer scribe or square rule or just use both? Well, I've done uh, probably more square rule buildings uh, and certainly more square rule workshops over the years. But um, uh, I've, done, uh, I've done pure scribe ones as well, quite a few of those. Because I'm interested in how long it took, uh, almost twice the time to do a scribe, uh, full scribe building than a, than a square rule building. So, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to know that in my own mind, paying a crew, I wanted to see what the time difference was. But uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll do a building that's a hybrid. So the major components might be square ruled, and then you throw in some crotches and curves and things and scribe those. Uh, so you can put together bents that are square ruled and then lay on scribe parts, basically. Um, and it depends on the budget. So if, if somebody wants to just a few curved crotch tree parts or whatever in their house, it'll be primarily a square rule building. You have just a few scribed elements. Um, so yeah, you can mix and match. Uh, and we do that in our workshops too. Sometimes we'll, we'll square rule some main components and then uh, take our time with the scribing because it does take more time. 
You know, Jack, the, the way you answered that question, it seemed like time was very important. That, that well, you know, you were keeping in your mind how much time it takes. How, how do you balance the time and the quality, R right? I mean, you, you know, like you can do both methods, but, but you're worried about the amount of time. You kept in your mind how, how much time it took to do one, and one takes a good deal longer than the other. But how does, how does quality affect that? You know, like there's time and then there's quality, and, and what do you think about that? Well, you know, when I was younger, uh, we used to get the Sears catalog in the mail uh, a couple times a year, and uh, all the Sears products would have a good, better, and best version of them. So you could get the Sears good ladder, which was a reasonable price one, and then there was the better ladder, and then there was the best ladder. And I don't know if anybody else remembers this, but I've, I've offered this to, uh, to uh, my clients over the years. You know, um, you've got the, the good, the better, and the best frame. You don't want to say the, the, the lousy, the, the medium, mediocre and then the great frame, you know, so you say good, better and best. They all sound okay. Um, so the good frame is like a barn frame. It's where you're, you're working quickly, you know, you get a few blowouts on your tenons or, you know, uh, maybe your peg holes don't come out and the other side is clean or you're, you're not carefully selecting each piece, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And then the better is, uh, you know, you're taking more time. It's, it's probably a house. Maybe you're gonna hand plane the timbers um, you know, maybe you're doing some book matching of braces, you know, you're taking more care and then the best would be, you know, perfect stuff. Using perfect quality timber, your braces is book matched with every one, one next to it, you're using a lot of curved stuff, you're hand planing everything, um, there's no tear outs in any of the joints, etc. And, and I had a different price schedule for each one of these. So, you know, even if somebody couldn't afford a, a beautiful building, they could still go for the, the good quality one and get a reasonable building. And they knew it from the get-go. So nobody was gonna say, Jack oh, that Jack Sobin, you know, stuff doesn't look so good, you know. Jack Sobin. They would say that this was his, his moderately priced version. Uh, and I'm trying to like appeal to everybody, just like the catalog was uh, when I was a kid there. Um, so I do think about cost and you know, I don't have a crew anymore. Um, but when you have a crew, of course, you got to make, make this job pay. And um, you can throw in a little extra something on, on each job. And I think if you want to get started with some crooked stuff, say, I'll throw that crotch in for free, you know. And in the next job, somebody sees that crotch in your pictures and they say, yeah, I want some more of those, you know. And that's kind of how I did it. You know, my first frame didn't have any of those tree parts in it. And... Um, you know, I got sort of worked into it over, over the time. Okay. So, you know, cost has to be, it, it has to pay for itself. You know, I mean, I had a sustainable business and, uh, and you know, I, I, the guys always got paid and <laughs> never ran into trouble on anything. You know, I always made money on things. And um, it's funny, though, the first frame I did after I, I got rid of my crew, I didn't get rid of my, my downsize, I call it, but the first frame I did on my own, I did my record number of joints in one day. I did 54 joints in one day on a building, all with hand tools. So this was a rough, it was, it was a, you know, the good quality barn. It wasn't a finished house. So I was rip sawing all my tenons on my braces and girts. Uh, and I was sawing a taper into the, the tenons as well. I wasn't sawing it parallel and then tapering it with a plane or a chisel afterwards. I was actually sawing a taper right into the tenon. Um, and I averaged about 40 joints a day, uh, but on, on one day I made it up to 54 joints and that's my, my lifetime uh, record. That sounds like a lot. Um, Eric uh, Glass, Glassel, you have a question? Uh, have your hand up. I'm not sure that's intentional, but you're on uh, mute, so. Yes, this is Eric from Calgary in Canada. Um, Jack, I got a question. I'm involved a little bit. I started doing sort of timber frames on the smaller size, like 12 by 16 or 16 by 20. But obviously getting into crack uh, construction or so, obviously smaller sizes must probably be more tempting. Uh, the last slide which you got on your right hand side, what size is that building approximately? Um. I want to say that's 16 by 20, maybe 22. Um, 
Um, is, is, there, is there a preference no. of yours to get going on a smaller size and, and get them the feel for it, or is it much of a muchness? Sure. Um, the ones we do at, um, uh, at Hartwood, uh, we've done, um, you know, I've lost track of how many crock workshops we've done there, but probably like eight of them. Uh, we've done a number of just one bay crock buildings. They're like 14 by 12 or 12 by 12 or uh, 14 by 14, something like that. So just two pairs of uh, crock blades. So that'd be a good size to start out with. And if you don't have really curved uh, crocks, um, you want to go with a steeper pitch on your roof. So most of the crock buildings in England have a, a pitch that's a three quarter pitch. It's about 40 almost 49 degrees. And uh, it lends itself to crux that aren't curved as much. Um, yeah. Let me get my pointer here. But uh, you measure the sweep on the crux on the inside of the curve. If you were to stretch it, a string across from tip to tip, the yeah. sweep is the di distance between the string and the, uh, the curve of the crux. And, uh, you know, typically they're about a foot or a foot and a half or something like that. So occasionally you'll find one that's like three feet. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but if, you, if you don't have really curved stuff, you know, I don't know what you got in, in, uh, in Calgary. Um, but if you don't have really curved stuff, then you, you go with a steeper roof. You can make do with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a new book out on crux, which I reviewed in, um, in timber framing. You should get a hold of that if you're really into crux. Uh, I wish I'd had that book back when I started back in the, uh, the 80s yeah, what, with my first crock yeah. building. Mm -hmm. what, what is that building? Uh, what is that book called? Uh, um, gee, you had to ask me that. Um, it's, uh, do you get timber framing? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it was reviewed in the last issue. Um, okay. It's the first, uh, first article in the last issue, right, Mac? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Will Beamer uh, reviewed it. I'm not certain. I think it, no, I reviewed it. it. Oh, you reviewed it. Buildings a survey. <laughs> Crux okay. an introduction thank survey. You. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Whoever said that, Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was me. Thanks, Crux yeah. building colon a survey. Yeah, so I'd recommend that book. It's got a lot of. It doesn't have a lot of uh, how to on how to build Crux, particularly yeah. you know how to how to the tool work and everything but it it's got a lot of different crux in there and you can sort of see how they use different shapes and, and packing pieces and and collars and yokes and all the parts that go in there um, uh, to make up the building mm -hmm. okay uh, jack, very much. Uh, jack um, um someone asked ben asks um are you familiar with moonwood and if so do you have any thoughts about uh, Building practice. I, I have no idea what this question means, Jack. What kind of wood? Moon wood. Are you familiar with moon wood? How do you spell that? Um, M O O N W O O D. Can Can I make a comment to that? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, Eric again. I, I've been involved, or sort of, I've been interested in that. This is actually uh, a company in Austria who is advertising this quite heavy and they are obviously doing the harvesting uh, at a certain time of a waning moon where they actually you have your least water in your tree and obviously that harvesting is done in in the cold months of the year and um, there is a company called um, uh, Holtz 100 H-O-L-Z 100 if you google this they give you a big rundown on um, it's obviously harvesting uh, wood at a certain time of the year where you got your least um, um, uh, it holds the least water or it pulls the least water and then the guy stores it and uses it and it's it's um, uh, it doesn't twist and give you any troubles so the company is holz100 uh, if you go onto the internet yeah, I'll take a look at that. Um, yeah, there's something to be said for when you cut the, the timber. I mean, the winter time is traditionally when it was done because uh, uh, supposedly there's less sap anyway in the forest and you can get it out and hew it out before the warm weather hits, which you get fungus and uh, 
insect uh, larvae attacking it. Um, an interesting thing I learned in, uh, when I was in Sweden, Norway, is about the, uh, the Pinus sylvestris over there, the Scots pine, we call it. Um, when they used it to build uh, the ancient monuments like the stave churches, apparently they would girdle the tree uh, uh, a few years before they were gonna cut it down. And it would, this girdling, uh, which is strip, peeling off strips of, uh, vertical strips of bark, would induce the tree to create more resin in the tree. Um, and, then, uh, and then when they cut it down and, and framed it up, it would be more durable. It would last longer, which is probably why these stave churches have been around for 800 years, uh, exposed to the weather. But they would periodically also brush on uh, the same sap that they harvested from stumps. They would, they would heat up the stumps until the sap would run out of them and they would use this, uh, they call it all back. Uh, today they still sell it um, and people still harvest the stuff in the forest. But they paint that on the timbers to make them last even longer yet. So, you know, they, they, were, they were planning ahead, you know, just like this, uh, this moonwood sort of thing. You know, when you cut the timber and, and, and girdling the trees ahead of time, uh, those are all ways that they had learned years ago and we're, we're starting to discover some of those. Uh, even more today. The next question that we have, Jack, concerns spiral grain. Um, it's the the uh, Drew Dodson s says that I've heard that trees with right-handed spiral grain are strong and trees with left-handed spiral grain are junk. Any thoughts on that? Well, I've heard that same discussion. I think it was the Bavarian carpenters that, that mentioned that in, in one of the books that I got. Um, what I've noticed is that, um, and no one, no one discusses what causes spiral grain. I've, I've looked through all sorts of, of uh, textbooks on forestry and, and things, and, and no, one is, no one says what causes spiral grain. They might they just say it's the spiraling of the juvenile cells, of course. But yeah, of course, all the cells are gonna be spiraling if the tree has spiral growth to it. But here's, here's my take on it, and uh, I don't know if I'm the first one that's come up with this, but uh, when I notice spiral grain in a forest, and I, I've worked a lot of stuff from the forest, is when um, there's ledge very close to the surface. And uh, around here, the ledge has veins of iron in it, which also creates magnetic fields in the ground. So, so my theory is that it's caused by magnetic fields in the earth. And those are stronger when there's ledge closest to the surface than if it's just, you know, 200 feet of sandy, gravelly soil below. And I once went on a walk with a, uh, a, um, a dowser that had, had what's called an L-rod. And L-rods are used by dowsers to, to find water. You know, there's these two rods that can swivel and point towards each other uh, to indicate a line of force in the ground. And this dowser was an expert. He only needed one of these, these L-rods to, to do the dowsing. And I don't know if anybody's heard of this sort of thing before, but anyway, we're walking through an old growth forest and, uh, and we're, we're just chatting and I, I happen to see behind this guy is a spiraling sugar maple, a real tight spiral. I mean, it's probably going 90 degrees, I mean, uh, 360 degrees and, and two feet of, of trunk length. And, uh, and it's behind him, he can't see it. I say, tell me what you feel right here where we're standing. And he just held out the L rod and it just started spinning. And he says, wow, it's kind of a spiraling field. So that sort of proved it for me. I mean, that was just one time, but uh, you know, that, that's my theory and what causes spiral grain in a tree. So uh, whether it's left-handed or right-handed, um, I'm not sure how that would make a difference. I mean, they say one follows the sun as it raises up through the sky. Uh, and the other one is from wind, but I, I don't think either one of them causes spiral. I'm, I'm sure it's to do with the magnetic fields. Now, um, it's also an interesting thing. Somebody noted that the spiraling changes direction every seven years. So it starts out in one direction and seven years it reverses and spirals in the other direction. Now, I've also heard that at the poles, the cycle that the poles move is seven years. So that kind of also reinforces the um, magnetic fields of the earth idea too. So 
So there you have it. Now, whether, you know, one unwinds, I mean, it, whenever I see a spiral timber in an old barn, and uh, it's obviously, um, the, the grain is spiraling, but it hasn't twisted. Um, we don't know for a fact that it wasn't rehewn because a lot of times they rehew things after they twisted. Um, uh, but it seems to be that if it's a right hand spiral, it doesn't usually have a twist to it. I mean, the grain is twisted, but not the timber. So that's, that's what I know about spiral grain. Well, log builders won't use left-hand spiral grain logs in their buildings. They, I guess, I guess they've learned that it doesn't work well. So of course, Robert Chambers is a, a, a log builder, uh, quite a bright man, uh, president of, or formerly president of the ILBA, the, the International Log Builders Association is, is always trying to find out more information about that. But as I understand it, the trees start out left, left-hand spiral at Juvenile Wood, and then almost all trees become right-hand spiral as they, as they age. So they start out left-hand spiral. So perhaps it's the fact that- um, Yeah, but if you've ever split, a, Mac, if you've ever split a piece of wood, it's not changing. It's always in the same direction. The entire, you know, when you split a piece of firewood that has a spiral grain, it's, it's the same direction all the way down. Now, the only woods that change direction are elm and uh, hackberry, as far as I know. So I'm not sure, you know, maybe that's a Western phenomenon. I, I've talked with Robert Chambers about that. Um, so he says that if it starts with a left, no, he said it starts with a, yeah, he said it starts with a left and goes to a right but it's doing it over a shorter rotation. So it seems to me that it could, go, it could keep on going left to right like that. Yeah, well, it's just a juvenile. Anyway, way. more research needs to be done on it, but. Yeah, that, that, that's probably true. So he's saying it's just juvenile wood that spirals. Yeah, um, Mira Steinbecker writes, ALBA standard that precludes left-hand spiral grain. That's the standard for log construction written by the ILBA. Um, and um, and accepted by the um, the uh, international building code, which is not really international; it's U.S. the U.S. Uh, building code. Um, but it precludes the use of the left-hand uh, spiral for applications. So there's there's uh, still some. You know, I don't want to go against the Canadian or the the Log Boat Association. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I have done some anecdotal testing, and there was no doubt that the left-hand spiral was considerably weaker, but that's anecdotal, so. Um, there's uh, probably much research needs to be done before we conclude anything about that. I do want to jump back to one of the questions. There's a civil engineer who, who uh, has been is non-practicing now. Uh, he was just wondering, can he build, do you think that he could build a timber frame home for himself by himself? Or do you think that, that, that uh, when he's 62, or do you think that that's perhaps a little bit uh, more ambitious than he's capable of doing? What's your opinion? Oh, uh, certainly. I mean, that's sort of been a big thrust of my career is designing people that uh, took my course and then built their own house. And sometimes went on to start a business afterwards. Sometimes they just built their house or maybe their barn too. Um, but yeah, it's certainly doable. Um, I, my barn that I put up uh, when I was 50 years old, I put up entirely by myself. Uh, it took me uh, 30 hours to put it up. But that was with ropes and pulleys and, you know, gin pole and sort of thing. Uh, and you can, you know, if you got a place to, to keep your timbers, uh, you know, you cover them up if they're outside or you put them in a garage or in your cellar or whatever, you can, you can drag it out over years. Um, I wouldn't do it with some hardwoods. Uh, you know, if you're using white pine, uh, it's pretty forgivable. You can let the time, pine dry out and it's not gonna be an issue. But if you're using, you know, sugar maple or beech or oak or something like that, it gets really hard to work when it dries out and it could twist on you or warp. Um, so I would, I would say certainly, yes. Um, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not sure where this fellow lives and what, what woods he has access to, but I would recommend white pine certainly would be one of those woods you could pick away at on, on weekends and, you know, uh, take, your, take your time doing it. Okay. 
Well, Jack, I'd, I'd like to thank you uh, for like a, a stimulating and interesting evening and for sharing it once again uh, the knowledge and experience that you've gained over so many years and for being such a leader in the timber framing industry. I'm sure uh, if, if people could clap, I'm sure they would, uh, they would do so now. An excellent talk. I'm trying to speak for the people who are, who, are, um, who are listening and unable to speak right now. Um, obviously, we'd just be a cacophony. So thank you very much.